Hello, first of all I have to uh, um, apologize for not being a musician. I'm not a musician and I d did not bring a musical instrument. I'm, uh, I'm, I do something else altogether, but I still want to talk about something that might be relevant. At least the other guys who are presenting already said it would be relevant. So, well, maybe for the rest of you too. Uh, I will be talking about uh, how our notion of nature is changing and actually how our idea of nature, technology and people and what they are, are is changing. But before I start my official part of the lecture, I still want to give you this short musical instrument, which is, uh, well, I find it pretty fascinating. in his rivals incorporates other sounds that he hears in the forest. Okay, so this is the, the copy based paste uh, bird, and I uh, assure you it's not media art, this is an actual bird. Um, hello, I am uh, Kurt, I am an artist, I'm a scientist, I'm a designer, uh, engineer, a philosopher, a producer, a doctor, a blogger, uh, so I guess in the end I'm sort of an amateur. Uh, I will show you some of my, uh, my paintings I make as an artist, it's this sort of Bob Ross kind of <laughs> interpretation, but of course there are some small changes. I also design, I often design speculative uh, products. This is a speculative product for the Coca-Cola company, Organic Coke. Once this uh, uh, hits the market, we know that the green bubble is, uh, has reached its peak. Um, and um, this is an installation I made. Actually, I show here a video from Japanese television. I don't know exactly what you're saying, but... So, 
わせの動きを表しているのだ風水の水量ポンプがインターネットと接続されており最新の為替相場の状況が風水の高さに Okay, so this is a video from a quiz show where a participant had to guess what this fountain did. And actually, it is the data fountain. It's connected to the internet, and every five seconds, the latest currency rates are taken from the internet and, well, directed onto the, the fountain. And here I'm explaining in Japanese how I got the idea. Um, actually, I, I made this thing, and I was thinking about it because I, I, I made it. Because when I look on the computer screen, I can see the weather report. But when I look outside of the window, window I also get sort of a weather report. But、uh, nowadays, well, of course, the financial data on the computer screens is much more important for people than the weather report. So that's why we made this fountain sort of as a natural phenomenon to visualize this abstract data. And、uh, I also started becoming very interested in,、uh, in the philosophy behind it and actually the relation between, well, cultural artifacts, natural artifacts. And,、uh, well, I thought, thought about it for quite a long time. And then I think I decided, what's this all about? And, well, this is now my answer. So, next nature. And, well, I think you know the drill.、Uh, we have to read along. Um, next nature, I, I will try to、uh, read along out loud. Nature changes along with us.、Um, nature, in the sense of trees, plants, animals, atoms, or climate, is、uh, getting increasingly controlled and governed by man. It has turned into a cultural category. At the same time, products of culture, which used to be in control of man, tend to outgrow us and become autonomous. So, one could say the natural powers shift to another field.、Uh, our established view on nature needs、uh, reconsideration, and we propose this term, next nature, for this culturally emerged nature. And then we emphasize that it's real nature, not artificial nature or simulated nature. Because if you look around you, highways, airports, supermarkets, they're all part of our natural environment now. And there may even come a moment that our connection with an industrially manufactured Coke bottle becomes more mythical than our relation with a genetically analyzed rabbit in the woods. Wild system genetic surprise, c o l l e technology, t o l l e r a n c e machinery is splendidly beautiful. I never make it. I never make it. Well, <laughs> but、uh, I still have some more time, so I will、uh, basically take the rest of my、uh, talk to explain you more about this next nature concept.、Um, First,、uh, some experience I had myself、uh, some years ago. I was walking with a friend in the dunes, and I don't know if people know this, but yeah, this is near Bloemendaal,、uh, uh, and、uh, it's this strange tree sticking out amidst all the other trees. And it turns out that this is, of course, not a tree, it's actually a cell phone antenna mast disguised <laughs> as a tree. And, well, I think it's quite interesting. I don't think it's a good design or so. Or I, don't, I think it's kind of tuttig in Dutch. I don't know, but uh,、um, it shows us two things. On the one hand, it shows us that we try to recreate our environment according to our image of nature. We try to have this nice natural landscape and we try to create that. On the other hand, it also shows how technology becomes part of our environment and how、uh, it becomes invisible in our environment. And we also want it to be invisible. Successful technology becomes invisible. And I think we all can agree here that this is not nature. I mean, this is a cell phone antenna mask, it's culture, and at best it's a picture of nature, like you would have, ha have a picture of nature hanging above your couch,、uh, but here it's in the landscape, big must. I have a few more examples.、Uh, these are all famous, I think, artificial islands in Dubai, and they also created the world map. And I think Dutch companies,、uh, Dutch people are a little bit jealous of this because、uh, actually in the 17th century, Voltaire used to say, God created the world, except for the Netherlands, that they have done themselves.、Uh, because in the Netherlands, they have this big tradition of building dikes and cultivating the landscape. And actually, it are also Dutch companies who, who、uh, create these things. And there are also some plans for、well, doing something.、Oh, yeah. In front of the Dutch coast, coast. I think this is a plan proposed by CDA. 
It's a political party in the Netherlands. Yeah, well, <laughs> I think, I, well, maybe you should think of something else. Or, <laughs> I don't know. Amsterdam, <laughs> Netherlands. Uh, I, I like this one the best. <laughs> would do perfect on Google Maps. But, um, we also have something in the Netherlands that goes even further than all of this because this is all, well, cultivating nature. And we are still the champions in this when we, we buy land from far farmers and we... Uh, push the farmers out, they have to leave, go somewhere else, and uh, then we recreate nature according to our image of what we thought it looked like 2000 years ago, and we call that regenerated prehistoric nature. Because especially in the Netherlands, everything is decided, it's such a small flat country, but then we regenerate prehistoric nature, and there are all kinds of problems as well, uh, because for instance this original animal, well no, that's actually not the original animal, because the original prehistoric cow became extinct in the 17th century, so it's no longer there, but it still needs to be there in this ecology. So what we do then, we well, try to find another one, and we found one, Scottish Highlander in Scotland, and they are now everywhere in the Netherlands, replacing sort of like actors, this extinct animal. And this shows all that nature uh, becomes culture, and nature is also a very good uh, and successful product. I have a short video or a commercial that I think is kind of, well, over the top, but it's an AT&T commercial. So it's springtime again, there are new mobile phones. I, I don't know, I think it's fascinating that you can sell anything with nature. Green electricity, green cars, natural condoms, it all exists. And uh, I, I tried to study that as well. Here you have a collection of brands and logos that use natural imagery, animals in this, uh, in this case. And I'm sure that nowadays, uh, not only in the Western world, children know more brands and logos than birds or tree species. So that's the situation we are in. And some children don't like chicken, but they do love dinosaur. So it says something about our, well, disconnectedness from uh, uh, old nature. Um, well, and scientists are also doing interesting things like, well, if there's no, if, if you're going to make a dinosaur nugget, why would you need an animal? So why not print the meat or tissue engineer the meat? And this is, of course, just a visualization. But this exists. It's presented by Zul and Katz a few years ago, victimless meat. And while well, it still, still change, uh, tastes like shit, I have to say, and it's very expensive, but it might be the future of meat. And... Um, Others are working on um, printing even whole human organs. Um, it's also interesting. Uh, basically, I, well, I have more, one more example. Um, all these examples about, are about the, the, how the born and the mate are fusing. Because uh, uh, born things and made things are fusing. And that's really a story of our time, I think. This is really an important thing that is happening now in our, in our time. And um, this also means that, that nature and culture, in a way, are, well, fusing, or we have some confusion about what nature and culture is, because the born is typically associated with nature. Uh, think of animals, trees, the climate. We did not make it, it was born, and, well, made things cars, mobile phones, they are culture. But now we live in a time in which these borders are fusing and uh, we're, we have some confusing as well. Uh, I actually think they are trading places. It's better to, know, uh, to say they are, they are taking each other's place. And I also try to remind it uh, for myself uh, like this. On the one hand, all, this, all the fruit becomes uh, square and at the same time, well, the, the highway structures become so complex and we cannot even solve the traffic jams uh, problem. So it's not only uh, nature that becomes culture, 
uh, because th this we already know for a very long time that this is happening, but now we start to realize that at the same time our culture also causes a nature again that's wild and unpredictable. Or to say that a little bit more pre precise, that on the one hand our natural environment is replaced by a world of design, a world we make, but at the same time our technological uh, world becomes so complex and uncontrollable, also intimate and primary, one could say, that we start to perceive it as a nature of its own. So the conclusion is that we, with our human culture, cause the rising of this next nature. And um, I have a few more examples. Uh, first of all, one from our lifetime, because, um, yeah, mobile phones. I think this is a strong example. It's, it's a bit abstract, but... Uh, it's something we, we were there, because I think everyone here lived in a time where there were no mobile phones. And there was this moment that they were introduced, and you thought, well, should I get one or not, maybe? Or, and you delay, or you are an early adapter. And then, at a certain moment, a few years later, everyone has a mobile phone. And when you leave your house without your mobile phone, well, you feel like you are almost missing a limb, like you're missing a part of yourself. So this technology really is introduced in your life. And at first it's alien, it's strange, but it quickly becomes a second nature to you. And maybe if it's there for a longer time, then it in the end might become a first nature. But obviously with mobile phones, that's not the case yet. But if I would have given this lecture uh, 100 years ago, I uh, perhaps would have talked, well, not about mobile phones, but about electric light, maybe. Um, because uh, in the begin beginning of when electric light was introduced, uh, there were these little plates in hotel rooms where it was introduced for the first time. <laughs> and they just, they just say, this room is equipped with Edison electric light. Do not attempt to, li to light with a match, simply turn the key on the wall by the door. People had to be, yeah, had to learn uh, what electric light was and how to deal with it. And especially this disclaimer is extremely interesting. The use of electricity for lighting is in no way harmful to health, nor does it affect the soundness of sleep. That's not something I think about when I think about electric light in my life, but when it was a new technology, people were wor worried about it, and they had a d debate about it, probably. And for us now, it's, well, it's just there. But still, when you think of it, electric light allows you to stay awake after sunset and have the different patterns in life, so it does change your everyday life. Um, electric light is certainly a second nature to us, but is it the first nature? Well, yeah, I perhaps, but if I would have given this lecture 10,000 years ago, I could have also lectured about next nature, uh, but then I would probably talk about agriculture. Um, nowadays, when we think of agriculture, if you see these two women, um, they are planting their crops, you think, well, that, that's nice, they're doing some farming, and it's probably organic, and... Uh, but 10,000 years ago, this was a technological re uh, revolution. People lived the hunting, gathering lifestyle, and then uh, the idea emerged to do agriculture, to plant crops and wait for them to grow, to domesticate animals. And there are still some researchers who say that since the beginning of agriculture, actually the human condition started or degraded, that our skeletons are less strong than they used to be, that we have more infectious diseases than we used to be, so that it, that it was actually a bad technology. But obviously, we cannot live uh, without agriculture anymore as a society with so many people on the planet. So it's, it's there, and it's there to, to stay. Um, if you look through the, through the whole uh, story of mankind, then you see all these moments where our uh, relationship with nature is changing. Uh, all these technological innovations, so stone axes, three million years ago, control over fire, three hundred year, thousand years ago, ag agriculture I already mentioned, uh, it goes on, writing, printing press, industrial revolution, and nowadays, today, we are living in the time of the, the bio, nano, and information technologies. These are the, the emerging technologies of our time that will be transforming our relationship with our natural environment. 
And basically, if you see the whole list, then, well, it's actually we are playing with fire all along. It's always that we are um, inventing these new technologies and, in a sense, playing with fire. And we should be careful doing that, but it's also in our nature uh, to do it. So it's more like how can we project uh, a track to... Uh, to deal with these technologies, and that's not a new question, that's a question we have been asking ourselves for a long time already. So one could say nature changes along with us, and uh, we people are, in a sense, catalyst of evolution. And once you have this way of looking, because the next nature of theory is really like a, um, a spectacle you can put on, and then once you have it on, you, you see the world a little differently, because then you, there are lots of places where you think, well, hmm, is this next nature? And to finalize my talk, I want to give a few examples. Like, for instance, this one. This is from my own bathroom. Um, these are all the razors that I've used throughout my life. <clears throat> so uh, I started out with, with this little one, just a little stick with two blades, actually. I got it from my older brother. And, uh, well, this morning I, I used this... Uh, well, it almost looks like a vacuum cleaner. It has a <laughs> battery in it and lead on it, and it has six blades. <clears throat> and I wonder, is this evolution? Because uh, in a sense, you see all these mutations building up on each other, and you also see different strategies. Some are about new technologies, other about more like different style, which reminds a little bit of the feathers of a peacock. And... Um, I wonder, is it evolution? Of course, people, the first thing you say, it's not because we are making this, but then it would be a co-evolution. It, it's an evolution between people and their technologies. And that's not new. If you look at the bees and the, and the flowers, they are also in a co-evolution because the flowers need the bees to, to spread their pollens and to propagate. So yeah, maybe it's uh, something similar situation we are in now. And when I walk into the supermarket, I also wonder, is this biodiversity? Of course, we, we hear probably biodiversity is not the right word. Maybe we should call it technodiversity, because uh, we, we hear these stories about how biodiversity is decreasing right now on the planet. But some other diversity is, seems to be increasing, the diversity of, well, different products, stuff that we make. And uh, actually, right now, there are more patents filed on the planet than there are species on the planet. And I wonder, is there some kind of relation? And how can we, as people, uh, find, a, find a balance in that or find a good way to deal with it? Also, when I look at the financial system, a flock of credit cards, that uh, sort of visualization of our financial system, should we also start to perceive our financial system as an ecosystem in its own right? Would it have helped us to uh, avoid the last crisis or maybe uh, guide it into a different uh, direction? If the financial system is an ecosystem, uh, in what sense does it different, differ from other ecosystems that we know? Like, for instance, a rainforest, that's an ecosystem as well. But if you look at that, that's a very old ecosystem. It's self-sustained. It, it uh, grows on sunlight. And uh, it, right now it's threatened. Whereas if you look at the financial system as an ecosystem, it's more new. It's not self-sustained because it feeds on rainforest, one could say. And uh, it's very threatening. It's a threatening system because it destroys also a lot. So uh, it's more of the, the wild, unpredictable nature that we, uh, that we used to know, but in a very different, different way. And finally, this, uh, this image, it's quite, uh, it's quite well known. I don't know if people know this, but this is not some solar system far, far away. This actually is a, a map of the Internet. And uh, so here you see all the computers on the Internet and their connections uh, between them. Um, they are mapped out, and then you get this structure. And I wonder, is this a natural phenomenon? Of course, we created it, we caused it, but it still seems, it seems to grow and grow tentacles of its own and have its own uh, autonomous uh, 
behavior because obviously since this picture was taken the internet already uh, grew and uh, well uh, right now today it would look differently um, so this is our next nature and um, yeah we are somewhere here in this map or you are here connected so you are connected and I think that means you can also make a difference uh, because anyhow how we start to deal with this, we still have to develop lots of methodologies, and that's what we, we're doing as well. But I'm sure of one thing, is, which is that in the end, we will get the nature we deserve. Uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
it's a strategy for the bird to, to be she very has successful. Has yes. She doesn't know it's <laughs> well, if let me let me give you a comparison. If you look at an animal like I don't know if you know it, the Philium giganticum, that's the walking leaf. That's an insect that mimics a leaf. So that this copying behavior already exists. It's just that now, uh, well, humans came in and we 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 have this different technological setting, and it intervenes with. Uh, what was already there, but ev for evolution, does it matter? This goes on, and that's that's also valid for us. It's just that we have perhaps some decisions to make on how we want to position ourselves in the I in that game, um, if we can. Mm -hmm. If you could just walk up to her and say hello, do you like my clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, yeah, you could say, although if you, if you say it's called extended nature, that assumes that the, the nature that lies under, underneath is, whereas my point is that next nature is always next, 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 and that's already has been going on for a long time. Yeah, so, yeah, that's uh, the question whether we should perceive nature as something static or something that's dynamic. Yeah sound and music, uh, then of course the tradition of musical instrument is interesting, but something that's also extremely interesting is the human perception of uh, sounds uh, as it was uh, 10,000 years ago. How, how, would, how would a caveman perceive sound? Uh, th that, that would be a very interesting question. And then the next question would be, how can we, uh, if there's still some genetic trace on how we uh, how our intuition relates to sound in our environment, can we also go back through to that and um, maybe revive that in a new technolo technological setting? So then you would end up with something in between uh, old nature and next nature. Uh, that would be very interesting. Um, something else that I think is, is, uh, is relevant, but I'm not an expert here. I think there are more experts in the room than, than me, but... Um, how, uh, how can uh, instruments uh, evolve? How can they grow? How can uh, uh, composition evolve? Can, uh, can, we, can we guide that? And um, um, yeah, I think that's, that's also relevant. A lot, a lot is happening that I know, for instance, in, in computer games already, and there are really composers are thinking on uh, musical scores in a different way than traditional composition, but, but, but very linear. So, um, yeah, those kind of things I would think are relevant. Yeah. Okay. I give it to... You uh, <laughs> I'm Troy Rogers, this is Stephen Kemper, and this is Scott Barton, and we make up uh, Expressive Machines Musical Instruments, and we're a group of composers who've been drawn uh, for various reasons to building um, computer-controlled mechanical instruments to produce music with, and uh, that's, that's what brought us, brought us here. Uh, we'll talk today about um, how we came to this, why, 
um, and what we've done in the past, and then our current project, Marie, which is what's next to us, the prototype for that, um, and, uh, and related issues. Um, but so, to begin with, I mean, I guess what's, what's probably interesting is we're, we're all three of us composers. We're not engineers. We're not, um, uh, yeah, we basically <laughs> don't, <laughs> in school-wise, we don't have any of the preparation to, uh, to do this or, or the instigation. The instigation came directly from musical goals. So, I mean, yeah, and we, you know, we're, we all played acoustic instruments, I think, to begin with. We're, we're acoustic musicians. We, we began to compose. We all compose electronic music, so we've all made tape pieces as well. Um, and I think ultimately there is something, um, there is a wanting, and I think this idea of that wanting ties in very well with the previous presentation of, of next nature, of trying to recapture something, keep some parts of sort of electronic composition that we liked, the control for me personally is certainly one of them, um, but also try and um, approach the, the problems that, you know, maybe, um, when you're confined to the loudspeaker, some of the problems that that you know, presents to you as a composer, um, find some ways to to uh, to, uh, to avert that. So um, so we came to robots um, in various ways. I started working with the disc disc clavier in my um, in my master's program. Troy did as well, um, and his and um, and so this idea of you know having control. Um, of, of real acoustic instruments became something that was very interesting. Um, and a prince, you know, from a compositional perspective, it gives you um, a number of ways to, to, uh, to be creative. One, in terms of, you know, certainly the obvious things like timing precision and speed and, um, but the less obvious things, the non-idiomatic, you know, people play in certain ways. So we, we were able to compose for instruments in non-idiomatic ways. Um, instrument design, new sort of timbral possibilities, uh, and then the idea of exploring, you know, what I refer to as, you know, machine aesthetics. What, um, what sort of personalities do these instruments have in and of themselves? What flaws and what capabilities combined can we explore um, musically? Um, and I think it's very interesting this idea. I and I often think of it in terms of sort of natural and synthetic, and make that. Um, that sort of that uh, contradiction between you know a lot of us who played acoustic instruments for a while there's some idea of naturalness with that um, and I think there's an idea of sort of the synthetic and something that's different than an other um, when we're when we're in a you know purely electronic um, environment and um, you know the extent to which we we sort of gravitate between them and make those more comfortable is is part of what we're doing. Yeah, and I think that just to add to that, this idea of sort of recapturing gesture in music, right. um, having sort of computer-controlled gestural associations, being able to see something move and hear a sound being made. Um, I mean, that's exciting to me personally, as opposed to speakers, which are wonderful, but also somewhat limiting. Um, also, the idea of spatialization, sound vocalization, um, you know, just something with moving parts is exciting to to play with and look at. And the and the you know resonant properties of real instruments too. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we'll just give you uh, our our first instrument that we created. Let's see if I can find her here. Is Pam. Uh, Pam is an, is a sense for polytangent automated multi monochord. So it's a multi fingered single string instrument. Except we put two strings that are tuned an octave apart on her, so it's a, um, that kind of monochord, and I'll just play a little snippet of this. I think just that much gives you a good idea of some of the things that, well, there, there's, a, there's a mix of things that's going on there, but you know, some of the um, ideas that we're interested in exploring come through just, just in that little clip in terms of, of course, capabilities of the machine that are beyond that of a, of a human, you know, doing, doing a, you know, what is it, like trill, yeah, whatever interval that is at, you know, 50 hertz or something is, is something. 
What's that? No, it's a no, no, recorded no. from an amplifier. Yeah, this is yeah, it's dirtied yeah, up. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not we're not about cleanliness all yeah. the time. <laughs> 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 uh, but or, you know, and what, yeah, I mean, this that? song was uh, I, I wrote a song if you want to call it that. Um, <laughs> it was inspired, uh, you know, by early days of listening to Metallica. Um, but I think it's an interesting. I mean, like Troy was saying, this sort of how does this machine play its version of heavy metal or something was something I was trying to think about. Um, you know, there are certain gestures that one programs naturally and one does not play as naturally. So the sort of looping arpeggios and things like that, um, they come out and just sort of the speed is one thing, but you can't just write fast. I mean, this could play fast all day long. It wouldn't be exciting. So how do you deal with something like that? You know, these are other compositional concerns that we've had and had to deal with. And, and, and importantly, one of our, you know, there are people coming at music or robotics from a number of different directions, and one of the things we're not necessarily interested in is just replacing human performers, um, that we really want to, um, and we do, and we're, we're doing more and more projects with, with robots and human performers in tandem. Um, but we want to see, you know, what the possibilities for the machines themselves are, rather than, you know, finding it. I a machine to play, you know, to try and replicate what a human can do badly. So I think our, like our second instrument, Maddie, multi-mallet multi automatic drumming instrument, it's, it's sort of an exploration of a single snare drum and what you can do in, in you know, a very, s the simplest possible way to maximize the, the timbral possibilities of the snare drum. I'll just play that much for now. It gives you gives you a sense, but I'll pause it there because you can see that uh, you know we've got different types of beaters. It has 15 um, beaters arranged so that you can take advantage of different parts of the drum head and get uh, different different uh, timbral possibilities that way. But also different beater types. We've got hard beaters, soft felt covered beaters, brushes, and then you know we go from center to rim. Um, and explore. There's also control, of course, over toggling the snare on and off. Um, but I think this is this uh, epitomizes in some way the kind of idea that we're going for. We're definitely not making um, anthropomorphic robots. We're not to try and maximize the um, the ability to play different parts of the snare drum. Making a multi-degree of freedom robotic arm and playing it that way with maybe a spinning magazine of drum heads is, is engineering-wise much more complex than we're interested in subjecting ourselves to at this point. We'd never get to the music if we if we did that. But also, um, there's no reason um, necessarily to, to do that because if you want, you know, even if you did that, executed that idea very well, um, there would always be an inherent delay between moving the arm from one position to the next and, and rotating the magazine to a certain point. And so musically, I mean, if, if you just want to be able to access all of these things as with as little latency as possible, just making a number of really simple mechanisms makes a lot more sense. And so that I think it gives a good idea of where we're coming from in terms of design and, um, and intent. And I think yeah, we're just we're solving I think mostly musical problems. That's right. Hopefully most of the time, um, you know. And if the simplest musical solution I think is generally the one we would prefer. Um, so we did. Uh, we've done a number. Of course, when we first build the instruments, you've got to explore them, and so we end up doing a lot of solo robot pieces, solo and, and ensemble robot pieces. But of course, you know these are output devices, so any input can be mapped to them, and we've started exploring that a little bit. Here's a small clip. Um, um, so this is a piece that I did with a belly dancer and composer, Ari Sue, and she's wearing a sensor interface that I designed that takes it's takes sort of limited amount of data and transmits it to um, two of our instruments, Pam and another instrument, Caddy, which is sort of a disembodied Maddie. It's a individual modular individual percussion, dr uh, percussion yeah. instrument, basically. You can connect striking devices to various types of instruments and reconfigure it. Um, and this piece is done in a more or less traditional, whatever that means, belly dance style, <laughs> uh, tribal fusion belly dance. So there's a couple moments that are interesting. So 
We can. Yeah, at the beginning of the piece, um, if it plays, um, at the beginning of the piece, she controls um, the speed of Pam and picking um, with. Okay. So we're basically just sort of playing the scale, and she's kind of in a position to play around with that. So here, her hip motion is controlling the picker back and forth in a very linear, uh, direct way. Um, as the piece goes on, uh, more of a sort of rhythmic texture develops, and she can sort of control uh, attacks on various instruments. Well, you, you get the idea, um, I think. So, again, it's kind of a completely different style. I never thought making these instruments would be making belly dance music, but I think it was fun. It was a fun project, and I think it, it turned out pretty well. Um, and, it, and it allowed her to, to use, you know, uh, traditional, yeah, like you said, traditional in. in, in Whatever way it's traditional um, <laughs> way of movement uh, to to expand upon the, the her her interaction with with the music that's going on. Um, this little clip, this actually is Caddy. Uh, we're going to show our other instrument, oh, and uh, probably is a nice um, thing to play after the after Kurt's presentation. Yeah, it's a oh. piece called Drum Circle. Yeah, so essentially these are these are the robots in the woods of Virginia, uh, the United States. Um, and yes, yeah, so the most relevant to the, the previous presentation, um, the robots are caddies playing various, you know, found objects, but also some of the drums that we brought and infused in nature. Yeah. And this is actually part of a DVD that's coming out called Agents Against Agency, being published by Ecosono label. And there's and there's something that's happening here in the center. As you have these um, stones, or right? pebbles. That yeah. Are so basically, the there's the the system is listening, is listening to the environment, um, is reacting um, algorithmically, is picking out rhythms, is reinterpreting what it hears, um, and 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 then expressing that through certain rhythms. Um, and then there's this sort of cyclic development. Um, and I think, for me, I think it's interesting also that. This is not machines sort of imposing their will on nature, rather they're tucking into it more, uh, you know, more subtly, um, and that's what we're trying to also achieve aesthetically a little bit by the sounds. So, um, let's see here. So, I mean, one one thing to, to maybe interject is that this is uh, what we're doing. Of course, is not at all new. This is a very Ancient, well, maybe well, nearly ancient pract practice. I mean, Hero of, of Alexandria uh, in the first century BC was working with pneumatic, pneumatically controlled instruments. Um, some of them, some of them musical, some or devices. Some of them musical. So um, you know, water organs and things like that. And continuous, uh, continuous automated music. Continuous exploration of automated music has been going on in the West since the 13th century or so, when carillons were developed in the Low Countries. Actually, with where you had before you ever had, I don't know if you know a carillon keyboard, but it's a fist-driven um, uh, uh, keyboard to to move the bells. Before that was actually developed, a, a, a peg drum was made um, as an automated way of controlling the instrument. So basically, a sequencer that's um, that's programmed me physically, mechanically into the drum, and that happened, you know, quite a while ago now. Um, and then you had the miniaturization. You went from weight-driven machines to spring-driven machines, tabletop clocks, watches, that sort of thing. Many of them retaining some kind of, uh, if it wasn't bells, then it became organ pipes and stringed instruments that were um, that were actuated 
mechanically, often, I mean, really in conjunction with timekeeping devices. They're royal playthings, essentially, um, luxury, luxury goods for, for the elite. And then you had, um, you had a sort of democratization and, and expansion of this. I mean, the golden age of, of the era came um, after first you had the cuckoo clock, um, and then you had orchestrians developed in the Black Forest region of Germany. And in the early, by, the, by the point of the early 20th century, in the US, uh, in the years between 1900 and 1920, about two million player pianos were sold in that period, which, out, which is more than the number of manually played pianos. So in our, I mean, in my view at least, in our view I think, um, this is less an outgrowth of computer music and more computer music is a veering off into virtual space of a process that's been going on for centuries. And now there's, I mean, there's, a, there's definitely a craving by us and by a lot of other people for a return to physicality and to what we first began talking about, the retention of all of the, all of the things we gain with uh, computer control but re-manifested in the physical world, and I think that's where the where the um, a lot of the interest lies for us. Um, I want to we want to transition now and just talk about the current project and what we're doing. It uh, it started. Um, I was uh, down the road in Ghent, Belgium, at the Logos Foundation, where a very large robotic orchestra um, and very advanced robotic orchestra is uh, has been developed by Gottfried Willem Raz. And um, I was working there, and a local group, uh, uh, at the time they're called Rare Degree, ear duo now, uh, Michael Strauss and Dana Jessen came down to do a concert, and we decided to do a piece together while they were there. And so th it's an improvisation for human and machine wins. And um, they are improvising with the monophonic wind instruments of the robotic orchestra. So you can see a couple of them. So you have so, and you have, well, somewhere <laughs> over here is, is uh, all right, you have heli, the helicon, you have, I guess you can't see all of them immediately, but there's a saxophone, an oboe, uh, and several other instruments. So I'll just play a little bit of this. <laughs> to work with, with robots. They already kind of knew um, some of the things they're interested in exploring with these instruments, with these devices. But it's very clear, looking at this room, all of these things are in sta welded stainless steel frames. Um, they're on wheels, so they can be easily transported by semi or something like that. But they don't fly well. Uh, they don't, they're, they're, they're a little heavy for, um, uh, for being transported by, by air. And the two of them you know, travel all around presenting concerts, and so they came with kind of a, a challenging proposition, which was we would like to commission some new robots, but we have to be able to fly with them. And so uh, this prototype is the direct result of, of, of this uh, encounter at, at the Logos Foundation. And what it resulted in is, let's see if I can get to it here. Is, there we go is, um, you know, we're thinking about, well, what kinds of instruments, and this is purely practical thinking at this point, what, what kinds of instruments are going to be interesting um, that are going to have acoustic sound sources that are mechanic mechanically activated um, that, that are, you know, going to end up small enough to, to transport but still interesting enough to, <laughs> to, to be able to make music with. And we came up, uh, it was great, as you know, constraints often foster uh, lots of little innovative pieces of thought. And so we thought of a uh, modularized robotic instrument um, where basically we have two separate instruments 
but eventually they're able to to interact that we can that we can sort of tap into not only the physical acoustic sound making but also utilize analog circuitry electro acoustic sound making to make a modular sort of instrument where where they can play through one another so the idea is that we're going to eventually have four of them I think we thought we all thought we'd have four of each of them by now but two months out we've got we're pretty happy to have just one of each and but the idea is there are two types one is is AMI is a single instrument AMI is an automated multi quote sorry automated mono chord instrument which is this this one right here four of them or two of them together form an ensemble but they mate with Kari Kari's Kari's are cylindrical aerophone robotic instruments basically a robotic clarinet so on Kari you have a closed cylindrical bore and tone holes that are solenoid driven that that allow you to access different resonant frequencies and then the idea that the maybe the the jump is and we haven't quite you know implemented this jump yet but we're close is that the two of them together form a Mari which is Monaco mono chord aerophone robotic instrument and the idea is since we have a pickup on AMI and we have a compression driver that's sort of the artificial mouth for Kari we can send the signal from AMI the actual you know picked up physical signal acoustic signal the string being plucked or struck or bowled electromagnetically and put it through the air column and we can also do the reverse we can we have mics inside of the bore of the air column that can feed back in through the electromagnetic bowing mechanism of AMI and and you know blow the string so pluck the air column blow the string these are ideas that people have been doing with physical modeling in software for a long time but we're trying to sort of bring it out into the physical realm so that's the idea and let's see so to make that happen we came up with this is basically a function diagram of how it works you have audio components and a signal chain you have control components and these are MIDI controlled devices we've been just pulled back to MIDI because it's old and low resolution and slow but it's robust and it works and and then you have of course power power components and the idea right off the bat is you have feedback audio feedback through each system and between one another so we set to work how we've been spending the past couple months so we actually we didn't have you know money to do this we had tour dates set up and we had you know basically was like these are where the robots are going the robots that don't exist yet and this is when and so we had to raise money and so we we did it we finally we couldn't figure out what to do actually we tried a couple of crazy you know crackpot ideas to you know snake oil and none of that panned out so we went to Kickstarter and we really lucked out and got a great response from this crowdsourced funding mechanism and so but it didn't leave us with much time we actually started that campaign in November got finished and successfully finished in early January and received the money in February so over the last couple of months we actually been able to implement the designs that started obviously making the the bore for Kari is what's happening here testing putting it together doing some testing of the instruments yeah Basic, basic workshop stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Yeah, it's it's just, no, it's not great. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's super good. I don't have great ventilation. <laughs> yeah. workshop. Um, but uh, putting together the moving bridge mechanism for AMI, uh, and and doing lots of things that you know some things happened because we just didn't have enough time. We didn't have enough time to order PCBs, so we actually just laser cut um, out of acrylic the sort of uh, component um, you know basically what you do on a PCB except it's uh, rastered uh, component placement and then vectored through holes 
and put it all together. And eventually, the other day, we <laughs> took the tram with the robots, unpacked them and stuff, and they made it here. No hassles, customs, every, everything was fine. So we're pretty happy to have uh, these, these portable um, devices. And so, of course, I want to demonstrate them for you now. And then we'll leave time. You yeah, know, plenty of time for closed. questions. And I'll just do a demo, and then, and then we want to leave time for questions. So, should we tell people to come up? Yeah, you can come close. Yeah, you don't have to sit. If you, you want know, to come up and watch. Just, yeah, see. you can come uh, and check out the instruments <laughs> themselves. I think we've worked our way through all the explosions. So yeah, there should shouldn't be, be any explosions. Should be good to go. Yeah. So, um, with, <laughs> with Kari, I'll demonstrate first. We have solenoids that control. The, I'm moving them now, um, opening and closing in sequence, uh, the tone holes for the instrument. And what we do, Kari is really a hybrid instrument. It is, in one way, it's just a robotic filter. Rather than, most, most uh, development of robotic instruments has been about percussion, about making you know, solenoids to strike things, or even the string instruments are sort of percussive in their output. But this is moving in a new direction of, of, of sort of a sound modifier rather than a sound generator. So we actually can tap into all the electroacoustic goodies of whatever signal we want to feed into the driver. But if I just feed in a sine wave, a sine wave. Oh, right. <laughs> that's, that's not coming through power, right? And then do a little oh, quick switch. Repatch. <laughs> All right, so Saying hello. Now that's a sine wave. What's happening is, you know, it doesn't, you can you hear it's not a sine wave on the output. The acoustic impedance of the air column is actually squarifying that sine wave. <laughs> that's, a, that's a real word. <laughs> yeah. So I'm opening and closing tone holes. Basically, I'm just getting. I'm playing um, a fundamental frequency that, that matches more or less with the uh, resonance combination of tone holes that are open and closed. And that's basically how, um, how Kari operates. Um, you can start to do um, experiment with other types of signals.